At some point in your walk with Jesus, you have to be a consumer and a distributor. You've got to distribute this word that has been placed in your heart and spread the good news about who Jesus is and what he's done for me and what he's done for you. The major difference between comfortable believers and growing disciples is that growing disciples understand that it's not my job to just come to church, it's actually my job to be the church. Your yes to Jesus is great, but your continual yes is better. Go ahead and turn your Bible to the book of Philippians chapter number one. Philippians chapter number one. Y'all be praying for me. I know the Lord has given me a word and it may come off a little strong, um, but oftentimes when the Lord gives us a strong message, it's not because he's mad at us, it's because he loves us. Uh, so with that being said, we're going to look at the book of Philippians chapter number one. We're going to spend the entirety of our time for the most part in the book of Philippians. Those of you who may be brand new to Jesus, welcome to the body of Christ. To give you context about the book of Philippians, it's written by a man who I would consider to be y'all just a straight up gangster for the gospel. None other than the apostle Paul. To give you context to that, uh, apostle Paul was this man who uh, known as Saul, was a terrorist to the Christian community, had an encounter with Jesus and was forever changed. And in my personal opinion, there's not a single person on earth outside of Jesus who did more work for the kingdom of God than the apostle Paul. That being said, he writes this letter to the church in Philippi. Uh, and he is going to, without question, encourage them. But here's what's really cool. There's no doubt about it, that he is intensely praying for them. And there's something very specific that we'll see once we get to verse 9 uh, that Paul is praying for that I really want to focus on. But until we get there, we're going to slow roll this. We're just going to look at verses 1 through 6 in the very beginning. So here's what it says. Philippians chapter number 1, and I'll give you the message title uh, once we get through this. Philippians chapter number 1, beginning at verse number 1. Here's what it says. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders and deacons. Verse 2, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. He says this in verse number 3, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Y'all, I love the tone that Paul reflects in this letter. You can tell he has the heart of a shepherd and you can tell that he is sincerely praying for believers in the church at Philippi. And just in my mind, I just feel like the same way that Paul has this love and this compassion and this enthusiasm about prayer for believers in Philippi, I have no doubt in my mind that right now in this moment that Jesus has the same love and compassion and uh, energy as he is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now making intercession for me and for you. Just somehow in my mind, y'all, I could see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father just saying, Father, ooh, I love them people at Pillar so much. Would you do me a huge favor, Lord? Would you just give them more of your grace and give them more of your peace? Father, I, I am so grateful for those people at Pillar Church right now. Matter of fact, here's why I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that we partnered with them and the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ for every nation, tribe, and tongue. I'm so elated. I can also see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father saying this, Father, I know only you know the day, the time, and the hour, but I am so grateful that you have set a date that man doesn't know but will one day reveal, be revealed that I'm coming back again. And, and here's why I think this is so important. The reason why I think this is so important, y'all, because we live in a world today especially at our churches in America, while they may be big, sometimes they can lack substance. And that's not a knock, I love the church. I love the church. My life has been changed and transformed by the church, which is me and you. But let us also be honest with the fact that some way we've gotten to a place to where there's a lot of messages that are being preached that are focused on us, when in actuality we need to hear more messages that are focused on him. 
And while this is not said typically on Sunday morning, especially if you don't know Jesus, I got news for you. I wanna let you know that one day, Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's coming back for me, he's coming back for you, and here's what's so amazing when he comes back, y'all. He is going to come back and he is going to eradicate sin. He's going to eradicate hurt. He's gonna eradicate pain. He's gonna eradicate death. And here's what's even better than that. The old shall be passed away and he's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth and the dead in Christ will rise, we'll receive our glorified bodies and with one big choir singing with the angels, we'll get to sing holy, holy, holy to the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth it's going to be an absolute glorious and wonderful and amazing day but until that day comes there's an assignment for me and you and here's my concern this is the burden that the Lord has given me my concern is that there are too many comfortable believers in the body of Christ Pastor Brent what do you mean that there are too many comfortable believers in the body of Christ. Here's the question that the Holy Spirit asked me in my private time, which is simply this. Are you a comfortable believer or are you a growing disciple? And this is the message title that I want us to focus on. Are you a comfortable believer or are you a growing disciple? How do we get here? Look at verse number six. He says, Paul says, I'm confident that the work that Christ began in you, he is going to be faithful or certain to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ returns. What that means is until Jesus Christ returns, you and I are what's called a sanctification process. What is the sanctification process? This means that when you and I said yes to Jesus, he declared righteousness on us, made us righteousness because our own righteousness is as filthy rags. But he declared us righteous and then he sanctified us, meaning he set us apart from the world. And when he set us apart from the world, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit who now indwells on the inside of us because we said yes to Jesus, now begins to do a transformative work in our hearts. But here's what's awesome about God. God is sovereign. What does that mean? That means that God has the ability to administer his will in the earth how he so chooses to. And in his sovereignty, he did something that was amazing. He gave me and you this thing called free will. Which means we're not robots who are going to automatically do exactly what it is that God tells us to do. So if that's the case, it is probable that Christ can begin a work in us. But if we're not surrendered to the Holy Spirit, we can fight against him doing the continual work that he wants to do. This is a tendency of the comfortable believer. A comfortable believer, just like a growing disciple, has this experience. Here's the experience. They were probably living a life where they had no hope, they had no peace, they had no joy, they heard the gospel message, and they said yes to Jesus. And they're saved. And comfortable believers are gonna be with us in heaven. Glory to God, that is amazing. But here's my only issue with comfortable believers. They give Jesus their yes for salvation, but they don't continue to give their Jesus their yes. They stop at salvation, but when they start reading this Bible and they start seeing verses that they don't like, they don't wanna say yes to those verses. I'm saying it a different way. Comfortable believers have a tendency to pick and choose when they want to follow. They have a tendency to pick and choose when they want to obey. Because sometimes the things that Jesus asks us to do can be difficult, and I understand that. But here's the reality. You and I have not been called to be comfortable believers because I went, when Jesus went to that cross, I don't think he died so that we could be comfortable believers. He died so that we can become growing disciples. What is a growing disciple? A growing disciple makes the word yes the primary word in their vocabulary as it relates to what it is that Jesus is asking them to do. So if I see something in this book that I don't disagree with, that's okay. I'm still going to say yes to you, Lord. I'm still going to submit. I'm still going to obey. I'm still going to surrender. And here's the truth of the matter. I think you and I need to get to the place to where we don't just come to church because we wanna be consumers of church. 
Here's the reality. It's, it's so easy to come to church that's, in all honesty, can be designed to consume. Like, I'm pretty sure 25% of y'all, when y'all pulled into the parking lot today, y'all went straight to Story Cafe because y'all wanted to consume that coffee. Right, and I'm pretty sure that before you even got to Story Cafe, when you walked in the doors, you didn't even have to open the door because we've got amazing greeters and they just opened it for you. You got to consume that good old hospitality, <laughs> right? And I'm not saying don't consume, consume, but at some point in your walk with Jesus, you have to be a consumer and a distributor. You've got to distribute this word that has been placed in your heart and spread the good news about who Jesus is and what he's done for me and what he's done for you. The major difference between comfortable believers and growing disciples is that growing disciples understand that it's not my job to just come to church, it's actually my job to be the church. And here's really what I'm trying to tell you to do. You and I have a choice that we can make. When we say yes to Jesus, here's the choice that we can take, make. The choice is, is you can choose between the blue pill and the red pill. <laughs> For context, really quick, how many people in this room have seen the movie The Matrix by show of hands? Let's go. If The Matrix, without question, is one of the most amazing movies that has ever been produced. And if you disagree with me, you're a sinner. That's okay. Bless your heart. Um, no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, you are a sinner saved by grace. Um, <laughs> But here it is, let me, let me give you context real quick. I was preparing this message, for some reason the Lord showed me, gave me this picture to use the matrix as an illustration and I thought it was so on um, point. The matrix, y'all, is a temporary world. It's a world that was built by computers. And there's a couple of people in this temporary world called the matrix who know the truth. One of the individuals who knows the truth about the Matrix is a man by the name of Morpheus, played by Lawrence Fishburne. He did an amazing job. And there's this iconic scene between Lawrence Fishburne and Keanu Reeves, who plays Neo, where they're in the Matrix, but they're in this room, and they're having a conversation. And Lawrence Fishburne, he's got his black glasses on and he's got his all black fitted suit and leather that boy was casket sharp for 1999 you hear me and they're 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 sitting in the chairs and morpheus asked neo a question and here's the question he asked him he says do you want to know the truth neo and Neo leans up and he says, what truth? And the next thing that comes out of Morpheus' mouth blows my mind. He says, that you are a slave, born in bondage, in a prison with no smell, no sight, and no taste. You are in a prison of your mind. And y'all, the reason why this blows my mind is because if you think about the world that we live in, we live in a world that will one day pass away. But listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse number 14. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse number 14, this world that will one day pass away. He's writing this letter and he talks about the word of God and sin. And here's what Paul says in Romans 7:14. He says, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. He says, the trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. Here's the thing, you and I in this temporary world, we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And Paul talks about even more in Romans chapter 7, how we have this thing called this sinful nature. It's the thing that keeps us in enmity between us and God. It tries to separate us. But even in this temporary world, because of the grace of God, God has given us his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, to be buried for us. And now he rose for us. And as a result of the blood that was shed on Calvary and the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us, we can be unplugged from this matrix world and know and come into the truth. And the truth is simply this, because of Jesus, I have now been set free. I no longer have to be bound by my sinful nature, but I can walk and do the things that it is that the Holy Spirit wants me to do so that I can be pleasing to him and bring all the glory to God. 
Real quick transparent moment, I truly thought that when I was gonna stand on this platform this morning, on Tuesday, I thought that I was gonna preach a message from Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven. Now, Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven is your favorite verse and you don't even know it, okay? What does Philippians 4, 6, and 7 say? Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says this. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but through prayer and supplication, make your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Real quick, just in preacher circles, that's one of those passages where you know you can get to go preach a happy message. It's one of those moments where you get to preach a message where you can make everybody shout and make everybody dance, and you can set it up so cute and set it up so eloquently. I can just see me right now back, back down in the south and I can, of the Mississippi, and I can be preaching a message, and I can be like, y'all, we live in a world where there are so many things to be anxious about. Anxious about the economy. Anxious about politics. Anxious about what's going on on your job. Anxious about what's happening in your marriage. But I came to tell somebody this morning to be anxious for nothing but through prayer and supplication. And, and I can go on and hoop you on now. Everybody wants to preach a happy message like that. But as I took some time and sat with the Lord, he said, Brent, if the book of Philippians was a bowl of rice, six and seven is nothing but a grain of it. I said, well, Lord, why did you, why did you give Paul the book of Philippians? Why did you really tell him to write? this book what's the burden behind the book and the burden is actually found in verse number nine let's look at it real quick chapter number one the book of philippians here's the burden paul the praying man says this i pray that your love will overflow more and more and watch this and that you will keep on growing growing in knowledge and understanding now, the burden that the Holy Spirit has for me to share with us this morning is that you and I have to become growing disciples. And here's what's so beautiful. I know that the, one of the reasons why Paul wrote Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is because as you and I grow to our knowledge and understanding of him, then it's easier for us to actually not be anxious about anything but pray about everything. Because the longer you live and the more you know about him, the less you worry about it. I'm pretty sure I got some people in my room, in this room right now, who are above 60. And if I were to ask them what is one of their biggest regrets in life, they would probably tell me that one of their biggest regrets in life is that when they were in their 20s and 30s, they spent so much time worrying. Right. See? She said that's right. I think she's over 60. <laughs> but here's why. Because the more you grow in him and the more you know about him, the more you start to trust him. This is why you and I have to grow and become maturing, growing disciples. Which now leads to this question. How do you know that you're a growing disciple? Let's keep reading the text. Here's what Paul says in verse number 10. He says, for I want you to understand what really matters. I don't know why, but in my mind, if it was me writing this church to the Philippi in 2024, here's what I say. I want you to understand that you need to stop being so petty. Like, that's what I want to put in the text. Um, but that's just me reading into it. Now, I don't know who that's for, but you catch it. Because I know some of y'all this week, the Lord been convicting you because you've been petty all week long. <laughs> Here it is. For I want you to understand what really matters. Because the things you're upset about, the things you are feeling away about in all actuality, in the big picture, really don't matter. Why? So that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. Here's part of the goal that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. When Christ sanctified us, he set us apart and the Holy Spirit starts to dwell on the inside of us. Here's what he wants us to have. He wants us to have a life that is pure and that's blameless. He wants us to have clean hands and a pure heart to come to him just as the little children does as he writes in Matthew. But here's how you know you're a growing disciple. It's found in verse number 11. It says this, may you always be filled. This is so key. You might want to underline this with the fruit of your salvation. The fruit of your salvation. Now, here's the question. What's the fruit of your salvation? It's the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. 
Now, if you're new to Jesus, the question you should be asking yourself, well, what is the fruit of salvation? Let's turn now to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but get ready to come back to Philippians. Galatians 5, verse 22, this is what we call the fruit of the Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit produces in us. And I'm pretty sure there's at least 25 to 40 percent of us in this room who could probably quote Galatians 5, 22, which is the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And here's what I need you to know. As easy as it was for me to spout that out, that's great. But I don't think the Lord really cares how quickly we can spout out a scripture. I think what he really wants to know is how well are you living that scripture? So here's what I wanna do. I actually wanna read Galatians 5.22, even though you already know what it says, but I wanna read it slow. And at the end of this, I'm gonna give you a little challenge. Here's what 5.22 says. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. I don't really care if you've been saved for a day or you've been saved for 50 years. If you are honest with yourself, on this list, there's probably two or three, three things that you probably need to be actively practicing in your walk with Christ. What does it look like for you to practice this fruit of love, not just with emotions, but with actions? What does it look like, husbands, to love your wife as Christ loved the church? And just in case you're confused, husbands, how much he loved the church. He loved his bride so much that he died for it. What does it look like for you to practice that type of love towards your spouse? What does it look like for you to practice that type of love towards your children? What does it look like for you to love your neighbor as yourself? Paul says joy. What does it look like? I know you have every reason to complain. I know you have every reason probably to be a little discouraged. I know you have every reason to probably want to feel the way that you're feeling right now. But what does it look like for you to take all of that and put it at the hands and feet of the Lord and say, you know what? Here's what scripture teaches me, that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And this joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world ain't gonna take it away. I'm gonna choose to be joyful even though it looks like there's nothing to be happy about. What does it look like for you to show the fruit of your salvation as a growing disciple in Jesus to say, you know what, instead of me trying to find peace in material things, instead of me trying to find peace in relationships, instead of me trying to find peace in my circumstances, I'm gonna put all of my attention on the Prince of Peace. Because true peace is only found in him. What, what does it look like in a world to where we love to microwave everything so quickly? And in a world to where we want results to happen overnight, what does it look like to say, you know what, I'm going to exercise patience and just simply wait on the Lord? And here's why I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait on the Lord because I know as I wait on him, he'll renew my strength. He'll make me mount up with wings as eagles. I'll run and not get weary. I'll walk and I won't faint. I'm going to exercise this gift of patience. Here's what I'm trying to say. Your yes to Jesus is great, but your continual yes is better. And in your continual yes, you make the commitment to say, I'm going to actively make sure that he sees the fruit of my salvation. But here's the other way that we know that we're a growing disciple, that I'm getting ready to land the plane pretty soon. Not only do we have to know what the fruit of our salvation is, not only should the Holy Spirit produce the fruit of salvation, however, we should also see the results of our salvation. Here's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 12. He says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. He says, work hard to show the results 
of your salvation. What are those results? It's obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Now, let me clarify something really quickly. Salvation is a free gift from God that cannot be earned. You cannot earn your salvation. I don't care how hard you work, it doesn't matter. You can't work for salvation. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he gave you this gift of salvation. It's 100% free. However, there should be some results of our salvation. And what are the results of our salvation? The results of our salvation is not when you text the word yes to 9400 and said yes to Jesus on Easter. The result of your salvation is when you start walking in obedience to his word and obedience to his will. The result of your salvation is when not only do you walk in obedience, but you have a reverence for who God is. My concern with the body of Christ is I'm not surprised that the world has no fear or no reverence for who God is. There's no expectation for the world to. But as I continue to look throughout the body all over the nation, my concern is, is that lack of fear and reverence for God is now starting to creep into the church. And the Holy Spirit wants to sanctify us, to set us apart, to put a desire in us, to walk in a way that pleases him. Now, there are some of you in this room who are wrestling every time I use a certain word, and that word is obedience. Obedience for a lot of people is a trigger word. But here's what's so amazing about Jesus. Jesus will never ask me and you to do something that he didn't first do himself. Jesus is the literal blueprint for what obedience looks like. How do I know it? Because Paul wrote about it in verse number five. Let's check it out. Philippians chapter two, verse number five. Look at Christ's obedience. Here's what Paul writes. He says to the church at Philippi, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Well, what's the attitude that Christ had? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As Paul would write in his letters, I urge you, I plead with you, I implore you, become a growing disciple with love as an under shepherd, take the red pill. Here's the reality, we have to take that pill every single day. It looks like one of my favorite verses, it's becoming an anchor verse in my life, you picking up your cross and following him and dying daily. My prayer is that every single in this person in this room will be willing to say, you know what, Lord, I don't just wanna be a comfortable believer. I wanna become a growing disciple. When I think about the love that you have for me, the way that you died on Calvary, when you didn't have to, when you know everything about me, you know all of my sin, you know all of my mess ups, you know all of my flaws, but yet you still died for me. Here's the truth of the matter. Let me help you out real quick. One day I told you that Jesus Christ is coming back and we have an entire eternity to be with him. And you know what that eternity is gonna be full of? Comfort. You've got a whole eternity to be, to be comfortable. But while you're here, here's the expectation. You gotta grow, fam. The expectation is that you gotta grow. The expectation here is not comfort. The expectation here is growth. And today we've gotta make a decision. Am I going to be a comfortable believer? You'll get to heaven. Or am I going to be a growing disciple? And when I get to heaven, I hear those words, well done, thy good and faithful 
serve. Can we stand real quick and let me pray for us? This morning, I feel like the prayer needs to just simply be a prayer of repentance. And let me give you context. Again, I said it at the beginning of the message, but I want to say it one more time. Anytime the Lord gives a stronger message like this, it's not because he's mad or angry. It's because he loves you. It's almost like a coach trying to coach you up. Today's message, I pray, is a message that was more so designed for the equipping of the saints. This is my commission to you. I need you to hear my voice really clearly. We put too much of a burden on pastors and pastoral staffs to be the hands and feet of Jesus. But when teachers of the gospel who do this vocationally stand up and proclaim this word, it's actually our assignment not to entertain you, but to equip you. There should be a burden on you to not just grow, but as Paul writes, to partner with God in the spreading of the gospel of Jesus. Don't just come and consume. And if you're brand new to Jesus, there's grace for you right now. You gotta learn first because you can't make a disciple until you first become a disciple. But there's some of you who you've been a believer for 10 years and still haven't become a disciple. So let's grow together. We're here for you. We're rooting for you. We're praying for you. Holy Spirit, thank you so much for this message. And I know when you give a message like this, it's because you love us. And we come right now with our hands outstretched saying, Father, we repent. We repent for the times that where we became casual Christians. We repent for the times where we just simply came to church and only consumed, but never even thought about distributing. Holy Spirit, we say that you have every right to do the continual work on the inside of our hearts, making us more like you. I pray that we would live lives that are pure and lives that are blameless. I pray that you would put the fire of the Holy Spirit down on the inside of us to where we would be changed and we would be transformed. And Lord, that we won't just be on this earth just living our lives, but we would be on this earth as weapons of mass destruction, tearing down the kingdom of darkness darkness and making sure that every single person we come in contact with has access to the marvelous light of Jesus. Make us the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Give us tongues that are bold, that will proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. In a world that is dying, in a world that is decaying, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would have not some of us, but you would have all of us. And for those of us who are even parents in this room, I pray that we would get to the place where we recognize that the first disciples we have to make are the children that are in our home. I pray as a people of the church, as a people of pillar, that we would have legacy families throughout this place, that we would have families where our children, our children's children, and our children's children's children will know the name of Jesus, and we will be kingdom families, and they shall be saved. So Holy Spirit, grow us into disciples. And we end this prayer by saying, our answer to you is yes. Now, Holy Spirit, whatever I failed in asking, I pray that you don't fail in granting. And it's in the matchless, the marvelous, the majestic name of Jesus Christ, we pray and give thanks. And everyone said, amen. I hope you were blessed by this message, and I truly hope you heard the Lord speaking to you through it. Before you go, make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new message is posted. And make sure to leave us a comment below sharing what God spoke to you and how he used this message in your life. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.